All right. Everybody, happy Sunday to you. Got Pat Bentley back with me tonight. Pat, thanks again for being here. Welcome. We're going to go over some, some interesting ice fishing tips and tactics tonight. But first off, I got to know if everybody can hear us and see us okay. So if you can, throw us a... Uh, Throw us a text on here. I got the tablet going so I can see the, uh, not a text, throw a comment on here so I can see that we're doing okay. See a few people chiming in already. Jordan Filippo, Chris Olson, how about them Lions? Go Lions, and we're going to the Super Bowl. Uh, probably <laughs> we, not this we year. We are. We're going to the Super Bowl. They That's it. Go. I'm completely on board. I'm completely sold. I'm all in. We're going. Nothing's stopping us. All right. Uh, all season anglers saying loud and clear. Jeff Abbott saying Lima Charlie also loud and clear. Blind Osprey's on. Tim, good to see you. Tim, uh, Tim was quick to send me a text after the Lions won today, so thanks for that, Tim. Uh, he's, I think he's also on the uh, Lions train that we're going to. Where's the Super Bowl this year? I don't know. Is it L.A.? Might be L.A. I think it might be L.A. I think we're going to L.A. That's where we're going. We'll take a trip. But yep, we're going. Uh, Robert Pringles here says, Go Lions also. T.D. Schlaud's here. Says, Pulled one off despite Campbell's best efforts to throw the game. <laughs> I, I'm not going to lie and say I don't disagree, or I disagree uh, with you because... They won in spite of you. Yes, it did. It, it got a little nail bitey at the end. Uh, I was figuring uh, that uh, some grandiose way they're going to throw that game away at the end. But they kept it together. Goff looked like a magician throwing that zinger into the end zone at the end. Minnesota honestly screwed up. They, they had such soft coverage on that play. They could have prevented that so easy, but they didn't. So we win. So sorry, Minnesota. You're still great, but uh, today we were a little better. Uh, Mark Pearson says it was like winning the Super Bowl today. That's I, true. They did celebrate. You know, if you, if you got to wait a year between wins, it does kind of feel like a Super Bowl, doesn't it? It is true. Uh, do we, I wonder if we got to wait another year um, before we get another win. Because I looked at the schedule. It's tough. I, I, it's yeah. tough. Um, so, hey, we'll see. But the Lions won today, so I'm pretty happy. Pat's pretty happy. Um, I, I'm sure there's a lot of other people out here in the Mitten State that are also pretty darn happy. So, who else we got here? We got Leroy Dowding on here from Purple Taco Fly Supply tonight. We will be drawing the name of the winner. Well, actually, Pat's going to draw the name. But we're going to draw the name of the winner tonight for the Black Friday sale for Purple Taco Fly Supply. So there's going to be five winners. We'll get to that here shortly. I'm just still checking out some of the comments. I always like seeing who's on here. Open Water Mike is on here from Indiana. Bill Gerlock, you're on here as well. We're giving away your boards tonight. Um, I have a winner for that. And who else we got? Jeff Abram is here, Super Bowl Lions, he says. See, we got a, we're, we're starting a trend. We're starting a trend. I think, who was it that sent, Tim, was that you, Blind Osprey, that sent me, they sent me something, I think, on Facebook. Might not have been you, Tim, and if it wasn't you, I apologize to whoever it was, but they it laid it out. If these, like, 40 things happen, the Lions could still make the playoffs. Not <laughs> the Super Bowl. Scenario, huh? not, the, uh. not the Super Bowl, but they could still make the playoffs if these, like, 40 things happen, so... I mean, there's a chance. Yeah. So, so you're saying there's a chance. Right, right. All right, Ryan Perch is on here from Frankfurt. Good to see you, Ryan. Pat Enos is on here. John Thompson, Phil Oden, Phil, uh, Pat Enos again. Teresa Flanders, Everett Vanderheide. Look at all these people. Lots of good people, a lot of familiar names. So um, I'm just going to throw this out here real quick. Hey, thanks to everybody for being on here every Sunday. Um, the, I mean, I see a lot of familiar names that come back every Sunday night, and it's great. But I see a lot of new people also, so thank you also for being here. Thanks to everyone that has been here. Thank you also to the new ones that are here. Thanks for giving us a try. We hope that uh, we don't disappoint. If you like what you see on the video, just tap that thumbs up button. That really does help the channel. Um, this time of the year, the channel gets a little, a little quiet because salmon seasons, you know, we're off season right now. So it gets a little quiet. So if you want to help the channel in any way, if this video helps you out, all I'm asking is you tap the like button. That lets YouTube know that you like the video. And the more people that do that, YouTube's going to grab that and send it out to more people. So I appreciate anybody that uh, takes the time, just hits that like button or even wants to subscribe. So we've got Bob Hunter, Bill Gerlock again. Bob Hunter says, restore the roar. <laughs> restore the roar. I, I put that on a shirt. It was restored for sure. I might put that on a shirt. Put restore the roar. I like that. 
Three Sticks Outdoors, I got some questions, I believe, from you that we're going to ask uh, Captain Pat tonight. Um, John Levitt's talking about the Tigers. I don't even want to talk about the Tigers. I'm still months away from talking about the Tigers, but uh, we will when the time is right. All right. All right, let's move on to a couple things, some housekeeping things that we need to do. Set this down for a moment. Get into my notes because, like I told Pat, if I don't write things down, I don't remember them. So, I've been through that. All right, Pat, Ger or, I'm sorry, uh, Gerlach, uh, Bill Gerlach, the boards that you're giving away. A couple weeks ago, we asked everybody, everyone to pick a number between one and a thousand to, for your chance to win those boards. He's got a nice set of boards he's giving away. So, the number that Siri picked out of nowhere was 873. The closest person I saw to that was Robert Lowry, L-O-H-R-E-Y, at 875, so two spots away. Uh, Robert, congratulations on that. I'm not sure how you're going to get with Bill to, uh, to get his information on how to get those boards. I know Bill is on here tonight. Um, Robert, if you're on here also, my suggestion would be just talk with Bill, see if you guys can change information in some way, and uh, he can get those boards sent out to you. If uh, that doesn't work, email me, chrisstangletackle at gmail.com. I'll reach out to Bill, and we'll get it set together somehow. So congratulations on those boards, Robert Lowry. Second thing, we got three giveaways tonight, so bear with me. The second one, for my Patreon supporters, thank you so much for supporting the channel on Patreon. You all do a, just, you do such a nice thing uh, by doing that. Uh, tonight, you know that the big giveaway is coming up on January, uh, on January 1st, December 31st, I give away a Charger Trip every year. Oh, nice. For somebody that supports us on Patreon. So that's coming up in just a couple weeks. But next week, no, let's actually do this two weeks from now. Let's not go next week, but the weekend after, I'll draw the winner for something else. I'm going to show you what that is right now. For our Patreon supporters, and if you want to support us on Patreon, you can still do so. If you make a $30 pledge per annual year, you're into the drawing for the Charter Giveaway. But just on a random giveaway, you're going to get this. And this is going to be given away two weeks from now to one of my Patreon supporters. You're going to get one of the big, the big tall ones, special mate spoon boxes. I know you've used these. I've got them. I've, I've got them. a ton of them. I love them too. Uh, in my opinion, probably not a better spoon box out there. No. Yeah. So you're going to get the tall one. If you've never seen the inside of one of these, I'll show you quick. Has all the dividers for your spoons. I use them for plugs also. Same. I got some friends that put stick baits in. Stick them. baits, Same plugs, thing. you name it. I think it holds like 150 different uh, divided objects, whatever you want to put in there. But to get you started, you're also going to get 24 Dreamweaver Super Slim spoons. Say that 10 times fast. No, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I do like the SS's though. I do too. Those are I great. Love them. So these are from Dreamweaver. I went down there last week and met with my friend Scott Argusinger, who's the general manager down there. We went through and picked out 12, um, 12 spoons. You're going to get a double of each one. So just for example, double crush, the Magic, Magic Man, Man, double orange crush, Magic Man, just for a couple. What else we got in here? Oh, we got the Starburst. I love that. That's yeah, I do. That's a good one. Uh, you know what I'll do? Instead of going through all these, what I'll do is I'll put a video up on Patreon showing you every spoon that you're going to get with that. So, if you support us on Patreon, if you are an active supporter for any pledge, you are automatically into that drawing. And like I said, I will draw that winner out in a couple, two weeks from today. We'll do that two weeks from today. That'll be the Sunday before Christmas, so it will be a nice Christmas gift for somebody. Mm -hmm. Well, cool. Uh, and again, thanks to all our Patreon supporters and all of you future possible Patreon supporters. We really appreciate everything that you do for the channel. And that's sincere. Now, what else we got on here? Ryan says he just bought a spoon box. He needs another one. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> I do. I do, too. I, I, every time I see one, I want to grab it. I want to get another one and go fill it up with spoons that I'll probably never use. But uh, Bill Gerlach says he has four of them. I'm sure that many people out there do, but you can never have too many. So... Let's move on to the Purple Taco Fly Supply giveaway. Let's do that right now. So I was requested 
by Leroy, actually Leroy's wife, Deb, that we do a super chat reel before we do the giveaway as like a drum roll. So drum roll, please. Ta-da! So ridiculous. It's <laughs> so obnoxious. But we gotta do it. So, oh. here's the rules on, this, on the Purple Taco Fly Supply giveaway. Five winners, five winners. Number one drawn is gonna get 100% off their order total. So number two and three drawn, half off their orders. Number four and five drawn, 25% off. So five winners coming up for you right now. Pat's drawing those out. Grand prize winner, if you don't mind, Mr. Bentley. Can do it. That's right there. Who you got? Leah Lyons. Miss Lyons, you are the grand prize winner for the Purple Taco. You get 100% off your order for the half off winner. Draw another one, please. There we go. You're welcome to read them. I know oh, I can do that. <laughs> Andrew Gherkin. Mr. Gherkin, you are the second place winner. You get 50% off. Number three. Okay. Yeah, they get stuck together. That's all right. I'll read this one. All right. Who you got? I can handle it. Robbie Fisher. Robbie Fisher. You get the third place prize, which is also 50% off your order. Number four, this is for 25% off your order. Who you got? We have Randy Beavis. Randy Beavis. So, Randy. Congratulations, Mr. Beavis. You get 25% off and the fifth place winner is Tyler Snedding. Tyler Snedding. Congratulations, Mr. Snedding. You get also 25% off your order. So, congrats to all five of you. Well done. I'm gonna give this to you again. Just because I have to. Oh, somebody super chatted also. Nice. Nissan Mead. How you doing, Mr. Mead? Good to see you, man. You are such a good supporter of the channel, man. Thank you so much for that. You get the reel also. I apologize to everybody's eardrums in advance. We'll give that one a good crank. Thanks, Nissan. I appreciate that, bud. All right. So we busted through the giveaways and we have, let me take a look. We're up to 71 people, 12 minutes in, uh, 28 thumbs up. Thanks for the thumbs up. Like I said, those do help the channel, especially if you thumbs up the video after it's posted to YouTube. That's when it really, really counts. So thanks. All right. You ready? Yeah. I think you are. Yeah, I know you're ready. So, Pat Bentley's back tonight. Thank you again for being here. I really do appreciate it. So, Captain Pat is one of the pro staff members at the Mark Martin Ice Fishing Vacation School. Yep. And if you don't mind, again, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, Mark is the, the pro and in the, in is the, the well-known name, but we take up to about 25 students. We have three schools a winter, uh, and I am one of the other instructors. So, there's a handful of us that uh, he brings along and we help teach and we help people get on and off the ice safely and we show people how to catch fish and just you know try to make make it to where they learn ice fishing a little bit better yeah. they're more comfortable they're more confident and they feel feel safe on the ice that's great huh? yeah. that's real good and you said about 25 students per session yep and you have three sessions i know Saginaw Bay, well, first one is Houghton Lake. Correct. Then Burt Lake, and then Saginaw Bay, is that correct? Uh, Mullet Lake. Mullet Lake, I'm and sorry. And then Saginaw yeah. Bay. Yep. Thank you. So if you're interested in getting on board with these guys, look, I talked to Mark last week uh, briefly. Uh, I might come out to the Mullet Lake one just for a day, and just he wants to do some, uh, some YouTube stuff and take a look at the school. But just talking with you, Pat, and talking with Mark also, man, what a bunch of good guys. Uh, some really good fishermen, too. Uh, I've heard great things about you as a fisherman, especially an ice fisherman, and of course Mark is well known. Yeah. Um, and some of the other names that I saw thrown out there also on his website, um, some names I've heard also in the past. So I don't think you're going to get a much better opportunity to learn at a very, very low student to instructor ratio. It's like two to one almost. Yeah, about, um, about two students to every every uh, pro staff or, or pro. Yep. And yeah. you get to. This is a really cool thing that I thought last last week when you and I talked was the opportunity to try all the gear. Because, oh, fabulous. Yeah, because I mean, I have my own gear, you have your own gear, and whoever else has their own. 
but I've always wanted to try that shanty, or I've always wanted to try that rod and reel combo. Or I've always wanted, you know what I mean? Yeah. And for the opportunity to just go out there and you can just play around with everything if you want to, um, learn to catch fish, learn the gear, flashers, shanties. We talked about all this last week, I know. Um, augers, shanties, flashers, you name it, rod and reel combos. Man, you can learn a lot of stuff there for a pretty reasonable price too. It, yeah, for, and you know, I mean, for some people they, they think that it, there's not much that we can we can teach them, mm -hmm. uh, but we take them right from a beginner who's never been on the ice before and wants to take it up. We've had students along that line, right? And we've had, I mean, I went as a student, as right. a licensed charter boat captain, went and you know it was amazing the things that I picked up. Absolutely. And, and then it's just kind of rolled from there. You know that that's one thing. If I'll just take a second to mirror that, there, you never stop learning. I no. mean, none of us do. And uh, there, when I go on other charter boats. I still look around and learn things every time I go. Yep. And maybe it's a it's a light bulb moment or maybe it's just a little thing, but there's always things to be learned. And that's one thing I want to say about this channel. Don't ever be afraid to ask a question on here. Right. Um, well, none of us are born with the ability to go out and catch fish. I mean, some people have that innate in you know inner sense where they can just go catch fish. Yep. They can't. Most of us are not blessed with that that uh, that gift and ability. So don't ever be afraid to ask questions on here. I still, when I sit down and talk with other charter captains, it always circles back to fishing. And we're always bouncing ideas off one another. I was just talking with a charter captain on Saturday night, and we talked for we talked charter fishing for almost two hours. Just bouncing ideas, you know, how do you do this? Well, I do this, so how do you do that? It's always great to keep learning, looking for that knowledge, and that your school. Yeah, the dinners, yeah. Every, every night we have dinner, every student, every pro staff talks about their day where they went what they used the success they had what they learned questions yeah and for everybody else that's listening else you'd just be like hey we we, yes. we were close to that but we weren't right on that for yes. if it was structure or yeah. man i didn't use a spoon i was using the jigging right yes and i should probably should have had a spoon absolutely you can start to put some of that stuff together for the now, next yeah. day yeah i've had people come on my boat before and i'm going off on a wide subject here but i've had people come on my boat for Specifically last year, he brought a spoon to me on that boat. Beat up old raggedy spoon, and I'm not gonna tell you which one it was. I never would've used that spoon in a million years. And he goes, try it, just try it for me. I said, okay. Three fish on it that day, all on that spoon. And now I have like five of them. Yep. And I'm sure I'll never catch another one on it. But you know, you're always learning from no matter who it is. Right. No matter who it is, there's always things to be learned. So don't, guess what I'm trying to circle back to everybody? Don't be afraid to ask questions on here. Don't feel that you're going to be labeled a Guggen or a noob um, just because you asked a question. No. I, it, I ask him questions all night long because I like to learn things. Well, yeah. and, and I'm not the end all be all either. We, I, we go oh, to yeah. the schools and we come in with an open mind that, you know, there might be a student shows up with something that we've never even considered right. or, uh, you know, a pro staff guy will have something that they've done and they'll share with us and you'd be like, hmm, I like maybe it. I need to adjust what I'm doing. Absolutely. Yep. yep. I, we do it all the time. So, hey. I just want to throw that out there to everybody. So tonight, uh, Pat's going to talk about tips and tactics, techniques uh, for ice fishing. And I thought the best way for us to do this is we would break it down into three parts. Uh, actually, four parts. The first part being early season ice. Second part, mid-season. Third part, late season. And then the fourth part will be never fished this lake before. If I want to go fish this lake, I know nothing about it. How would I go about doing that? Sure. Yeah. So part one. Early season ice. What can you? What are you doing for early season ice? What are you looking for? Uh, we're we're going to look for green weeds, and and that holds true kind of right through because green weeds means oxygen. Yeah. Um, early ice. There's lots of oxygen in the water. Fish are fairly active. Yeah. They're fairly aggressive. So it doesn't matter what you're going for, but um, uh, if we're going to a, a lake, I mean, we just use the school as an example. We're gonna drill, the, the first guys there are gonna go drill a bunch of holes and we're gonna start looking for weed edges and we're gonna start looking for green weeds. There you go. Uh, Cause that's gonna indicate, I mean, obviously when you stick the camera down, you're gonna see if there's fish around. Sure. But we're really looking for that green vegetation. And what, what kind of species are you really focusing on early season? Primarily for me, it's walleye. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, that's just, uh, I, I enjoy catching them. I enjoy chasing them. Yeah. Um, that's. It's not all that we teach at the schools, but mm -hmm. that's a good portion of it. Yeah. Because I mean, that's what Mark has made his, his living at, is catching sure. walleyes. Absolutely. And that's you know what people relate to. But by the same token, at Mullet Lake last year, we got into um, bourbon. Mm -hmm. 
And I mean, to the point where I don't know how many of this one particular group caught in a day. It might have been 40 or 50. Oh, but they had a ball. Wow. So they were, but they got on the right spot and they, they were marking fish and they could get them to bite and they had all kinds of fun with it. But I, I would say for me, early ice, I'm, I'm going to go chase walleyes and I'm going to be looking fairly shallow because at that time of the year, yeah. you know, there's still like this, well, it's snowing to be heck here it today. Is. We got six, eight inches, but when before ice up those fish are moving shallow in the in the in the nighttime you know yep. dusk and all night and they're, they're going shallow and they're feeding they're still going to be on that pattern even when it ices up so you couldn't agree more you, you can get in you know five six feet of water the yep. trick is in there you can't make much noise yeah, okay. you got to be quiet excellent gotta be stealthy. Point. excellent point because yep. if you're walking around i mean and if you get good glare ice that's you know and hard ice is great but if you're walking around with your creepers on, you know, can, those, those fish know where you're at. And they can see you too, yeah. through that, that, that early ice. Yeah. yeah, it's one thing I've actually preached on this channel before, some of the best walleye fishing that you can do trolling wise is late fall walleye, because you can get them up in the shallows like yeah. that. You can get those stick baits up there on boards and catch them because they are up there feeding. I've got some friends that within the last week on the west side of the state here on Drowned River Mouth, Oh yeah, had some phenomenal walleye catch. That's it. Oh, yeah. Erie's going crazy too, Saginaw Bay right yeah, now. Yeah, but they're all going crazy. I know. There's a you, lot of fish there. You can't beat those places. So, what would be some of the the tactics that you would use as far as presentations? I I I'm always got two rods rigged. Okay. And I'll grab one here because yeah. I mean we talked. I'll get a little into the you know the, going to a new lake. Mm -hmm. If you ask any of us on March Pro staff. What our go-to is, you're more than likely going to get 12, 15 different answers because we've all got that lure that we're confident with. We yeah. know exactly how to fish it. Yeah. I, I, Gary Birch, who's one of the guys, will fish a glass rattle spoon. Okay. Because he knows how to work it and make it pop. Uh, Mark likes a black and gold little Rapala, mm -hmm. you know, a five or a seven. For me, it's a it's a slender spoon. Okay. So the, the it's just a spoon. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see it here. I'll, I'll, go ahead and have a seat. I'm just going to bring the camera right up to you. All right. I'll cover a couple little tips with just... Let me spin this around here. Starting. Get my fat fingers out of the way. Just lost internet for a moment. If we did, we're back. Um, please let us know. Somebody shoot a comment in here real quick because it looked like we just lost the internet for a moment. All right, there we go. All right, now we're back. Okay, thanks everybody. Cool. So go ahead on the on that spoon again okay. if you don't mind. So the, the spoon is it's a, it's called slender spoon. I prefer the golden glow because you can always glow it up. If you look at this spoon, all spoons have got a belly on it. It's just like this. And as you see how my treble hook is hanging, there's the single hook is over the belly, and the two other hooks are over the, I would say, you know, the, the other part of the spoon. You always hook your bait, because I, I use minnow head. Some guys use a full minnow. I like just putting the minnow on there and then just pinching it off, just a perch minnow. But it always goes on the hook that is in line with the belly. Always. Okay. Not all the spoon manufacturers pay attention to this when they put their hooks on or they've got a machine. So one of the things that we always do when you pull a spoon out of the package, first thing I do is check the hooks. Great idea. Make sure that that, that single hook is, is right on the, on the belly of that spoon. And while you're zoomed in here, another thing that we do, you can see the tag end of my line. Yes. We always leave a long tag. Okay. I mean, you've got this whole big chunk of line that's running up here anyway. Mm -hmm. It doesn't affect the action. We just go into that small snap. But we leave that long tag in, so you tie your knot, and then, you know, I know friends that they'll cut right down tight to that knot. Mm -hmm. It looks pretty, but if they didn't seat it properly, right. and they get a big fish on, they come back with a pig's tail on the end of their line, and no snap and no lure. We always just leave that so if it doesn't set properly, and then, you know, you get a good pull, you've got a little bit of play. You don't lose any fish. Great point. Yep, great point. Not a bad idea because you can never set those things all the way down. Right. Yeah, especially on that light line because right. you don't want to be busting it off there. So this is my go-to. This is what I'm going to start with is a is a slender spoon with a minnow head on it. And I'll work that watching my electronics to see if I get fish that come in. My other rod that's going to be rigged with me 
we'll have a horizontal presentation. This hangs, as you can see, it hangs vertical. My other rod will have something in a vertical presentation, most likely a jigging ring. So, I don't have a rod rig with it, but, but a jigging wrap of, of some sort. Sometimes they want something that's horizontal, sometimes they want something that's vertical. But if I've got both of them in my arsenal and I work three or four fish and they won't bite one, then I'm going to switch to the other. Great point. Yeah. So do you ever put uh, added things on your jigging wraps, such as a half a minnow, a minnow yeah. head? Yep. Okay. Min um, I'm a, I, I guess for me, I've always been just a minnow head guy. Occasionally, I'll put a full minnow, and there's some tricks. You know, you can put three minnows if it's a tough bite and whatnot. But mm -hmm. I'll always just put one minnow head on there, or a minnow on, pinch the head off. Some guys will cut them. I like to pinch it just so there's some stuff hanging. Absolutely. It gets more scent out, and it's crazy because if you watch on the camera, that walleye will come up, and that's what he's biting. Yeah. It's just where you've got that minnow. So what uh, kind of action would you be using on your rods for each technique? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. For, for the spoons, and, and, and I recommend this, you know, if, if you get a new lure and you're just trying it out and you want to see how it's going to, going to react, um, I stick it in the hole. Okay. Tie it on, put it right in the hole, and you can work it up and down and see how it flutters. You know, does it flutter right down? Does it walk off to the side? Does it swing back after that? You know, I mean, just you get a feel for what it does. But generally with this slender spoon, I'm going to lift it 15 to 18 inches, and it flutters off to the side, and then it's going to swing back down underneath. Okay. And I'm just going to keep repeating that process until I get a fish that comes in and looks at it. Once the fish comes in, that, I mean, so I'm, I'm doing a big lift. So it's, you know, 15, 18, 20 inches, I'll lift it up, and I'll let it walk off to the side, swing it down, and when it swings down, I'm generally about six inches off the bottom. Okay. A fish comes in, and then I'm going to just get just above the fish. So on my electronics, I'll see the fish and I'll see my jig, and I will work this just above, just above the fish. If they don't, they'll come up and look at it. If they don't bite, I take it away from them. Yeah. They'll come up, they don't bite, I take it away from them. They come up, they don't bite, I take it away from them. And you're always going up, aren't yeah. you? Yep. If they leave, the first thing we do is go right to the bottom and pound it. So we'll go right down and just bang, 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 bang on bottom and then bring it up six inches. And what do you think that does? It's a, it's a wounded minnow. It's got the scent. It's got the minnow head on there. It goes down, you're flopping around in the silk, and then you're bringing it up and serving it on it. Yeah, that's a great they'll tactic. They'll come in and smash it sometimes. Other times they'll come back, and then you repeat the game. You go up, they come up. You go up, they come up. They go up, they come up. If they bite, you know, obviously you want to try to set the hook. If they don't stick, one takes a swing at it, and you swing and miss. I mean, that's what I always say. What's the first thing you do when you miss a fish? People are like, swear. <laughs> I'm like, okay, besides that, they're like, oh, I'll reel out and see if I've got bait. Well, how many times do you have bait? You know, at least half of the time. So the first thing we do, fish comes in and grabs it, and he misses, we go right to the bottom, and we pound that thing on the bottom, and then we'll bring it back up about six inches. Got it. Give him, okay, he took a swing in a minnow, and he missed it. Well, now it's a wounded minnow. So it went to the bottom, it fluttered around, and we bring it up just a little bit. Beautiful. So that's how I'm going to work that. If I was going to work the jigging wraps, any of the wraps, whether it's the moonshines, which I have a lot of, and I really like those because in the low light they have an outstanding glow on them, or the ones made by Rappel. You know, these come up, and then they'll come out to the side, and then they'll turn, come right back down, and then center under the hole again. Yes. So it's pretty much the same. I start out with the same motion. So I'm coming up, you know, 15 inches to 24 inches up, letting that thing circle around and come back down under. Um, the aggressive fish are just going to come in and smash it. And we love those because everybody can catch them. You don't have to do anything fancy. The, the ones that you got to finesse a little bit, that's the same deal. So you're going to play that same game. The fish comes in, you know, you can see him on there, you'll jiggle it. He doesn't take it, and I'll take it up six inches. And then they'll come up and look at it. They'll take it, and you know, they'll come up. So I'm watching this on my electronics. I use a flasher. The guys that use the liquid crystals, they see the same thing. They see the jig come up, they see the fish. The guys that are using the camera are actually watching the jig come up and the fish come up to it. You know, fish leaves, then they go right to pound bottom and bring it up. Sometimes that fish comes back, sometimes another fish that you didn't know that was there pops in, and then you play the game again. 
And that's why a flasher, I mean, it really pays for itself in the long run. It does. Just any of the electronics that you can get that show, tell you that there's a fish underneath. And there, really, I mean, if you think about it, how else would you know that unless you had a camera down yeah. or unless you had clear enough ice and shallow enough water? Right. I mean, other than that... We're typically in low light, you can't sink fish. Exactly. So, I mean, that's that's where a flasher is going to pay dividends. Mm -hmm. I mean, just being able to see... Because you wouldn't be able to use these techniques in any other way. If You you wouldn't know a fish is down there looking at your bait. You wouldn't know when to bring it up. You wouldn't right. know when he chases it. You'd you just would, be jigging blind and, and people catch fish. I caught fish years ago doing that. Yes. Now that I have the electronics and I can see that, okay, man, there's two fish that just came up here. You know, maybe I can get the competition bite. I'll, I'll be aggressive with this thing and keep it coming up and we'll see if we can't trigger one of those guys to outdo his buddy to get that now. Absolutely. Now, somebody just asked a question. It's a good question. One we covered last week, but you want to know rod length and action. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a good question. For walleyes, I absolutely love this rod. And we talked a little bit about it last week. It is a custom rod that I had, that I got from uh, Big Flicker, which is uh, B-I-G-F-U-U-T. You can look them up on Facebook. They're on there. They make some gorgeous rods. And they set this one up for me. It's their legend. It has a good backbone. So irregardless of what I'm fishing, if I set the hook, I know that I've got plenty there to set the hook, and it's got a fast tip. Do you know the length on that rod, Pat? Uh, don't off the top of my head. I think it's 26. I was going to guess 26 to 30 somewhere yeah. in there. So, yes. You can, you can see where it, it bends and then it stiffens. I like something along those lines or maybe just a little bit more bend out on the tip, but I want a good backbone because when you're, you get to set the hook, we don't have huge hooks on any of these things. So having, as you can see, we've got a small, I don't know, 12. Probably about, 10. A, yeah, 10 or 12. You don't have a lot. So if you got a real whippy tip, it's going to be hard. You want something here that, as soon as you get some weight, is going to give you that, that chance to get into it. Absolutely. So that that's that's what I prefer for walleyes. Great. Think, and it, I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate where I can get this this nice, this beautiful custom rod. But if you're going to go to any of the tackle shops, I mean, right here at Tangle Tackle, if you pick up a rod that's lengthwise, I have a big shame. So I can use some longer rods. I've got some longer. But if you use, if you if you pick up a rod and it feels balanced, I and mean, you can see this thing balances really nice, you know, it's, it's not hard to hold it for the day. Put a little uh, president on it, a fluger, the, the fire line. But if you've got something that's got good backbone, it has some action on the tip, I think that will serve you well. Somewhere well, in that 24 to 30 inch range. And not just for walleye either. I mean, that's a good oh, multi-species yeah. setup. Pike, you can catch lake trout on it. Panfish. Um, you can. Yeah, you I mean, can. you're you're a little overdone for panfish, yeah, the, but the tip is probably just a touch stiff for those. But I mean, if you're deep water perching or something, yes. I think you absolutely can. Okay. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Yeah, excellent, excellent setup. So uh, early spring walleye. What about panfish? Or uh, not spring? I'm sorry. Early, early sea, ice. early ice walleye. What about panfish? Early uh, ice. We're looking. Typically, a waxworm is, is going to be the go-to bait there. So, you know, some sort of a, either a halite or a sitka type. You know, with the, anything that's got the the, the got. Anything that's got. If you're going to go a little bit deeper, you can get this. One of the spots that we like to go early in the year is get shallow for panfish. So you're you're going to again look for those weed edges. I like the good old Haley jig. Yep. You know, it's a Haley. I think this might be a Sitka, but either way, just the weight, some paint on it, and a little chain dropper to a, just a simple little hook. Absolutely. Put a, put a wax worm or two on that, and, you know, you're fishing. But where my panfish, where that other rod is so stiff, this is also a Bigfoot that they made. I mean, this end is unbelievable. I mean, we can... Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, it doesn't take much. I can put a teardrop on that, which will do for... You know, for, for bluegills, um, you know, this thing is kind of a multi-species. We can do perch, we can do bluegills, we can do crappie. Um, but again, I think if, if I'm going early in the year, I'm going to get out and I'm going to drill some holes. If it's a lake I've not been to before, I'm going to spend some time, drill some holes, find some green weeds, see if I can see some fish in them. If it's a lake I've been to and it's a spot that I know, then we'll go set up and, and, and get on that. 
Absolutely. All right, so let's move on into uh, mid-ice season. And everybody, if you don't mind, if you have questions for Pat or I, let's hold off to the end of the uh, end of the discussion here. You can. I have that tablet over there ready for questions, and we will field anything that comes our way. And if we don't know the answer, we'll yes, tell you. We don't know the. Answer. Yep, we'll we'll, we'll that find somebody. About Atlantics, which I did get an answer for. So we'll, yeah. we'll cover that when we get the questions. All right. So mid-season. Mid-season. Uh, you've got plenty of good ice. All the lakes are accessible. You can get where you want to go. Um, at that point, the oxygen level has been depleted a little bit. And typically in those shallow areas, you've got snow that's set up over the top of it. So those, those weeds tend to die. Um, so we're going to be a little bit deeper. But again, we're going to look for green weeds. I mean, that's kind of the key all, all, all through on any type of inland body of water. On Saginaw Bay, obviously there's no green weeds there, but that's a whole different animal. Um, but you're gonna you're gonna be focusing probably a little bit deeper. So we're catching those walleyes to start off with in you know five, six, eight, ten feet of water. Now that that 15 foot, that magic depth, that's where I love to fish. You know that's when we're fishing. We're gonna move to those weed edges, those drop offs that kind of focus right around that depth. I'm gonna use the same two lures. What I might do is if I'm marking a lot of fish and they won't hit my vertical and they won't hit my horizontal. I'm going to downsize. So as the later we go in the year, we find a lot of times we have to downsize to get fish to bite because they just start getting more fit. Yeah. The longer you go, you know, through the ice season. But for for walleyes, we love that 15, 18 foot of water. It's great. They tend to be there. There tends to be oxygen there. There tends to be food there. You know, we get some green plants and, and away we go. Um, for panfish, very similar. You can get on those weed edges. Uh, we've got a spot we were talking about just before we came on, on Houghton Lake that all uh, well, the Bigfoot folks came and fished with us last year. And we caught crappie, we caught big jumbo perch, we caught uh, pike, and we caught walleye, all in the same general area, maybe in a 75 foot diameter circle. Um, now, do, you, do you find that multi-species will crowd up in a certain area? In this case, we've got good weeds and shallow. It starts up maybe in six, eight feet of water with dense weeds. We're not fishing there, but we know that that's off to the side. And then as you come out, it gets a little bit deeper. We're in, we find that magic, you know, the bottom of the drop is at 15 foot. There's some weeds scattered around. So the fish, it's just kind of a spot where they cruise through all the time. And I think that the, the denser weeds that are just behind us hold the panfish. And then the predators are cruising, obviously, that edge. They're looking, looking for dinner. We've caught... I mean, you name it, if it's in that lake, we seem to have caught it right there, which is very cool. But, That's a great place to be there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're going to give me those You're gonna give me those coordinates, no, right? No, I'm not. <laughs> I didn't think you My would. My son actually found that spot. <laughs> it was like, where do we want to go, buddy? He says, there. That was maybe six years ago, and we'd always go back and at least look there. All right, so really the same techniques that you were using early ice, yep. you're using mid-ice, but you're just moving out a little deeper. We're just going a little bit deeper. Yep. Okay, looking for the weed edges, like you said, drop-offs. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. So as we get to late ice, um, got to, downsizing is probably the key to your, to your late season. So I would go a smaller one of these. I would go to a smaller jig and wrap. Um, just downsizing because the fish are not that active. They're not that aggressive. Um, you know, they've had ice up for, you know, could be months depending on, on the year and your location. Um, the, the thing that we, we do try to focus on with that is with, with walleyes, as ice is starting to come off, they're starting to head towards spawn. So um, you can start to look near, if, if you've got good ice near a river, mouth, that's a very good spot to go focus, especially if it holds some drop offs and points or a good weed edge. Something that they're going to be staging up to get ready to go spawn and you can catch them right at the end of the season. We've done that on, on many lakes. If you, if you just, if you pay a little attention, you check with the local COs on, hey, where do the walleyes go spawn here? If they stay in the lake, you know, is there a rock and reef? Is there this, is there that? And you can start working around those areas and try to find more schools of fish. Panfish, again, I think they probably go a little deeper. Or if that 15 to 18 foot, you know, of water, 15 to 20, 15 to 25 feet, is still holding you know, good green weeds that still got oxygen, they should still be there. Um, 
I know locally, you get any of these ground river mouths along the west side of Michigan, and perch are going to come in, especially if the lake, you know, it's connected to Lake Michigan, the perch will come in. That Haley jig, you know, works really well to get you down, because a lot of times those fish are deeper. They're just coming in from the big lake, and they're, they're coming in to spawn, or they're coming in because some food came in, and they're chasing, you know, whatever, shiners or something. Now, in that time of the year, would you do anything different with the Haley jig as far as Lure or a minnow, wax worm yep. still? Uh, if, if I'm going perch, it, it's, a lot of times it's hard to bait a minnow. And so you can hook that minnow, I guess, I mean, we play around with it because they, they, the, the, the panfish can change their mood, you know, within the hour. So they want it all hooked in the mid, in the lips. So you hook the minnow through the lips and you're catching fish. And then you quick catch your fish and you keep marking them. So you bring it up and then hook them like you would hook the tip up, you know, hook it right in the back so the minnow hold, hangs horizontal, you drop it down and they'll bite that. Mm -hmm. Or you can switch to a wax worm or some spikes or, I mean, we'll just play around with it. Uh, you know, uh, one of the pro staff guys, if we're on a bluegill bite someplace, we're down by Big Rapids last year and got on a really nice bluegill bite on an inland lake down there. And, you know, for the first 20 minutes, they didn't want us to move it. So you would just hold this thing dead still and then you'd see the tip. You know, you'd see the bite, you'd set the hook. Well, then all of a sudden that quit, and he's like, you got to jig it, but they only want it coming up. So you just work up, pretty soon you get bit. Now they want it really aggressive. Now they want it still again. And he's very good about just running through all the different scenarios that they can do with that. That's fairly early in the year. As you get later in the year, I say that because as you get later in the year, a lot of times with the panfish, they've seen jigs. They've seen you work them, and you've just got to be patient with them. So slowing down downsizing your jig you know to a very small like little tungsten jig head as opposed to this big big thing here um you know spikes and wax ones and very subtle with your movements i think that's as, as opposed to you know, really being aggressive with them which you can be i think that's one of the most overlooked things is late late season ice is people tend to get over aggressive yeah and, and i have to I, occasionally i have to just downshift I'm like wait a minute man i'm way too aggressive i'm going way too fast slow down yep and then you just reset and then then you know set fish comes up and then maybe it's just a subtle and then you just tap the rod on the side and that's all it takes it's just that little vibration in the and the other key to that is what you'd already said also is downsizing yes yep because that goes right in it hand to hand when the people get finicky or people the fish get finicky <laughs> people get finicky too but when the fish do get finicky uh, they, they're not wanting that big gaudy thing anymore right. they want that smaller presentation yep. Yeah, great, great point. All right, I'm going to set this phone back up in its spot. Sure. Actually, you know what? Grab that rod box really quick if you don't oh, mind. Yeah. Everybody, we wanted to show you this. Well, actually, I'm going to show you this too. If you're in, if you're looking for ice fishing gear, we got a nice selection here just starting off, but we have some of the shanties set up right now, like this clam insulated single man. I love this thing. I would love to have it. Um, there's the double nook over there as well. Tons of augers in stock, more, uh, more shanties, more everything that you're looking for. If you go on tangletacklecompany.com, you're going to find about anything that you need. And if you're in town, stop by. we got all the minnows that's in, waxies and spikes and everything else that you're going to need also. But I thought this thing was pretty cool. It is. So we just, got, we just got these in. I say we. I don't own the shop, but... Uh, the owner just got these in. I thought, what? A, somebody finally got their head out of there, you know where, and came up with something that could really save some broken rods. Because I know how many I've stepped on over the years, yep. or my buddies have stepped on, or I laid on a heater, <laughs> or shot down a hole. You know what I'm talking oh, about. Yeah. yeah. So this uh, is the new rod boxes that we have in the shop. I'd say they're probably 36 inches long or so. Yeah. Hard case, um, and it comes with the ability to, well, it says right there, ice fishing rod box, holds up to eight rods. Oh, what's that say? 24 inches. That doesn't seem right, but. Uh, no, it's 24.2. Oh, it's the boxes. Right. But anyway, that is a nice little system right there. If you open that back up again for me, Pat. So it has the foam inserts that you can actually, it comes with it. You can move those around anywhere you want. Those are completely adjustable. Move them anywhere in the box. And they're pre-cut for up to eight ice fishing rods. And then another little thing here, they got a couple of nice little, uh, little external holders on the side. You can put stuff in there. You can put your beer in there if you want to, I suppose. <laughs> Close that up right. so, so, nobody, yeah, so nobody can get them. 
And then uh, at the end of the day, you throw your rods and your other gear back in there, take it on home with we, you. We do recommend rod cases, whether it's a soft case or a hard case. We're, at the school, we're typically on big water. Yeah. And especially Saginaw Bay, because it gets, even if you've got good ice, it drifts. And so you're constantly going over these drifts as you're running six, eight, seven miles, whatever it is to get to where you're going to go fish. Right. It can beat up lures it can beat up your rods and so we make sure that all of our stuff is always yeah always in the case i think one of those uh rod boxes right there are gonna end up in my my arsenal this year for sure but uh, just wanted to show everybody that now let's get this camera turned back around one moment please get my fat fingers back out of the way again There we go, and we're back. All right, so the last thing I wanted to talk about, if you don't mind, because this is a question I get all the time for salmon fishing and other things like that. Um, I'm going to a new spot, never been there before. Yep. And uh, if I'm going there and I wanna, I wanna have some success without ever setting foot on that lake in the past, how would I do that? Uh, I was going to try and show you, but I see I need to renew my subscription. Okay. Um, we use Navionics. So it doesn't matter the lake. Uh, you know, I mean, we've been to a, a lot of lakes around the state, and every time that we go there the first time, I mean, one of the things we're always doing is studying lake maps. So we'll get, uh, I like Navionics, because it's right on your phone. Uh, for 15 bucks a year, you get the whole U.S. Um, all the lakes are mapped, it's great. And then what we'll do is I'll take it and I'll break it down depth-wise by color. So from zero to 10 feet is white. Okay. And then from 10 to say 13 feet is the blue. And then red is you know, 13 to 18, which is where I really want to focus. Mm -hmm. And then deeper than that, we'll make a light green and then really deep, you know, you can. Mm -hmm. So you take a look at it and all of a sudden, this, I mean, the depths, like we talked, that 15 foot, that magic depth that we like to fish, it pops out at you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just everywhere in the lake. And it's like, oh, well, geez, there's a great inside turn at that depth. Maybe that's a spot that we should go sure. take a look at. Yep. Um, and so on it, it'll have, you know, sometimes it'll have vegetation on the maps. So you know that it's okay it's shallow right here with a lot of vegetation but at some point there's got to be an edge mm -hmm. you know so we can go take a look at that so by edge i mean just so we're talking the same thing by edge you're just talking the edge of the weeds where mm -hmm. the weeds stop and breaks into yep. to a hard bottom or sand bottom or yeah, it, yeah sometimes it's just depth causes that yep. and other times it's a transition from from you know whatever the the, the weed is growing in to a hard bottom or it's rock yep. or whatever yep. but a lot of times that'll be a spot to look but we'll use the navionics to eliminate a lot of water and then once we've, we'll pick out these spots, you know, we'll be sitting at breakfast, everybody's got their phone out, we're just looking, and it's like, okay. For example, we went to Lake Musaki in, uh, mm -hmm. in Lake City a few years back. We're all at breakfast, we're like, all right, well, let's, let's try this, try this, try this. So we just broke off, and we went and, and started breaking down the lake, and then you meet up for lunch, and who had success and who didn't, and then you can kind of start putting it together. Sure. If you're going by yourself, the, the thing that I would I would recommend, especially, I mean, let's just talk walleyes because that's kind of in, in my wheelhouse and people like them because they're so good to eat. And they are a challenge. Yes, they are. That say 13 to 18 feet of water is what I'm gonna focus my on for depth. Um, I'm gonna be looking for the, a, an end of a point that's in about that depth of water, or I'm gonna be looking for an inside turn. So for where that point, point comes out and then comes back into the main lake mm -hmm. bank, those inside corners are great spots because those predator fish bite the wall sure. and will push bait up into those. Um, or, you know, you've just got a, a shoreline that's doing this, and also there's an inside corner. Maybe it's not a point, but it's just, that's just the way the lake goes. Mm -hmm. Those are the spots that we're going to start. Gotcha. Uh, and then we're always going to go to our go-to lures. So I'm going to have the slender spoon on. Mark's going to have the jig wrap on. Gary's going to have his rattle jigs. You know, yeah, I could go right down with each one of the guys and what they tell them. Tell them you know what, what, they want, what right? they're what they're all going to start with, and then as we start having success, then you know, okay, well, I'll take this off and put something else on. If somebody's you know, man, I got a dozen already, and nobody else has had a bite, well, maybe we need to switch them. Maybe we got to do something. But yep. if you're going by yourself, um, get a lure that you you understand. 
when, when, I, when I went to the school as a student, Mark Rumball was one of the pros, mm -hmm. and he still is the walleye pro, but he's the one that showed me this. So it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and like you said earlier, any of the students can come and sit with Andy right. and check stuff out. So I right. went and checked out a shanty, well, and he showed me how to fish this. We stuck it in the hole, and we jigged it. And so he showed me the action, because I'm watching it three feet under the edge. Then we stuck it all the way down, and he showed me on the electronics what it looked like. Then he turned his camera on, and I saw how it worked. And I bought two of them that night, and I caught two walleyes the next day with it. And since then, that's this has been the go-to. That's the thing. You know, I, I had confidence in it. For anybody out there who's going out and, and going to try this, you'll have your confidence lure, and, and maybe it's the slender yep. spoon, or maybe it's the yep. jig and wrap, or maybe it's the sidewinder, or maybe, I mean, the, the Cleos, Joe Giuliani from Sioux Canada. Yeah. He's always got a Cleo. Cleo's he's got a good. red and gold one, or he's got a glow one. Mm -hmm. Either way, he's he, he just fishes those, because he's it's his com he's comfortable with it. He knows exactly what he's doing when he's working it. See, that, that's one thing you touched on there, and I've touched on in the past on my other videos, is confidence in fishing. Yep. How they can change the game for you. Because you'll get your confidence lures, you'll get the, that A group of lures that you're going to use every time, the B group and the C group, but you all seem to find your way back to that A group yeah. every time. There's certain spots that you use, and the more, con the more you get out there and build that confidence, yeah. the more you're going to enjoy the sport, even if you have a, a bad day, um, even if you have a bad bite day. And just, we've had lots of students that... I mean, that was a big thing, was being able to read the map. Yeah. And, and that's uh, one of the, the pro staff guys out of Muskegon, his name is Jeff Kissel, showed us all how to set those depth ranges up with color. And then you just start laughing because you're like, oh my gosh. We just by accident have been fishing one of the spots that just looks great, and, or man, you know, right here is where we should be. We're, you know, it's just one of those deals. But Light bulb moments. So, so, yeah, it was. Yeah. But, We've had a lot of students that when they leave the school, we'll get a text from them. Hey, check this out. And they'll circle a spot, you know, a screenshot. I'm going here tonight. Yeah. I'm like, all right, good luck. And then I get a picture of a golden fish. There you go. Like, okay. I get that all the time through the summer. That. Yeah, people will call me up. Hey, well, can, you, can you give me anything right now? I want to go catch a salmon. You know, if I was going to go to one place, where could you tell me to go? And I'll give them a couple of things and what's been working. And I love it. At the end of the night, I'll get a picture on my phone of them holding up a couple 20 yeah. pounders. And they'll say, you know, many times, hey, it's the first one that we ever got. Thanks. Great, great feeling. Not, not just that you gave them something, but they had success. Yeah. Well, and that's, it, it, a lot of it has to do with confidence. There's a, a good friend of mine. He's an outdoor writer. He lives in Luddington. And he's, he comes to the schools, and he participates. He fishes. He helps teach. But he has always got an open mind, and yeah. he's always listening. And he came back uh, to Luddington. And he picked out a spot on Hamlin Lake on the map that just said, boy, there's a lot of big fish there. And we, our phones all light up. And he's holding a nice wall. There you and go. You're like, holy cow. You know, yeah. so it, that, that's the rewarding thing is that, yep, that works. But if you're going to a new lake, if you if you don't have the, the smartphone, you can get the lake maps. There's, there's still paper maps mm -hmm. and stuff available. But mm -hmm. um, I would recommend that because it's so easy. You're just at home. Everybody's got Wi-Fi now. Mm -hmm. You can sit there and play with that. And you'd be like, oh, this is perfect. I, this is where I should be. This is what I'm looking for. So yeah. if, if you're gonna, if you're going to a new lake, it's not a lake you've ever been at before. Take the Navionics, isolate that 13 to 18 feet of water, mm -hmm. and start looking. As, it'll put that color band throughout the whole lake. Great idea. And yeah. now you can break down a lake. Great idea. And you can eliminate. 70, 80 percent of the lake at that point, and now you you can break it down to where, man, it's a huge lake. But geez, I I really only want to fish these four spots. That that is such a great point. If you can change the colors on those maps, because I remember the first time I saw a topographical map, yeah. I was like, you know, it just looked like gibberish. Me lines running everywhere. Which way's up? Which way's down? Yep. And over time, I learned it. But to have color introduced into those maps. Oh. All of a sudden, your mind starts deciphering. I got to renew my sub subscription. It's, it wouldn't <laughs> let me in there tonight, right? I showed we'll you like Houghton Lake and just showed right? you where it's. Well, when you get your log, just, just email it to me so yeah. I can. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, one, one thing I want to touch on real quick on, uh, on late season ice, and you touched on it a little bit. When do you really deploy your tip ups? Because I know one of my favorite things to do late season is to get on that 12 to 20 foot edge, uh, especially on like the south side of Portage Lake, which I know you know mm -hmm. very well, by Camp Tocibo. Yes. And all I'll do is I'll throw my three tip-ups out, I'll sit in a shanty, 
and I'll wait for those spawning pike to come or those spawning walleye to come. And I'll stagger one at maybe 20, one at 12, and one in the middle. And that is some of the best fishing yes. I've ever found out there is that late season stuff. Is that something you do also? Absolutely. Yeah. That same area will hold perch earlier. Oh, absolutely. And I do the yeah. same thing. I'll go out and I'll, there'll be two of us, so if my son comes, we'll set six tip-ups. Mm -hmm. And then you get a fly. Mm -hmm. And if one starts popping, that's where we go jig and then we just kind of keep an eye on the rest yeah. of them. But you can catch, right, with the, with just the tip-ups like we talked last time, with those number 12 trebles and yeah. six-pound fluorocarbon yep. leaders. Yeah. You can catch some really nice perch on Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's some of my favorite fishing, though, for ice fishing, that late season. But you're, you're activity. exactly right. That late season, in that area, because it's a big, it's, it's, it's a gradual flat that comes up, and yes. there are some sparse weeds in it, but there's not nothing dense, nothing to cut. But you're right, that's yeah. one of the best areas. There. Yep, love that spot. So great, great advice, though, on if you've never fished a lake before, check out those electronics, check out that Navionics. Check out the paper maps if you don't have the Navionics. Start to look for those breaks that he's talking about. Those inside corners, great, great spots. I know that from past experience. Out on points especially. Why do you think points hold fish the way they do? I don't know if it holds them, but it funnels them. Yeah. So if the bottom of the point is in, say, 16 feet of water, so where the tip of that point meets the flatter area, yeah. those fish that are swimming along either side are going to hit that, and then they're just going to follow it and they're gonna turn and come right around the end of that point. That's why the tip is so good. I think it just, because the fish are moving yep. along that edge, it's just, it's a hallway. Yes, yep. Yeah, very rarely they go up over right. over the point. They'll, they'll follow those They contours. just come right around it. And of course the predators are gonna be there waiting for the, for lunchtime, for the dinner bell to go off and, and find those fish there. Great points, Pat. I mean, really, really good information. Thank you so much. Um, we still got a bunch of people on here. Let's, oh, let me say this real quick. If you're looking for more information on how he rigs up his rods, his reels, his tip-ups, watch last week's video. He went over a ton of stuff. If you want to get out there and just learn from the best on the ice uh, in the state of Michigan, really maybe anywhere, check out the school. Check out Mark Martin's Ice Fishing Vacation School. It's... I think I posted a link in last week's video. I'll post a link down below also. Um, but really, if they wanted to get a hold of somebody, what's the easiest way? Just search it on the web? I, yeah. yeah. If, you, if you just Google Ice Fishing Vacation School, that will be the very first thing that pops up. You hit the, the home page. It's got the three schools, the dates. It's got all of Mark's contact information, and you can get right a hold of Mark there. Yep. Give him a call. Let him know what school you might be interested in, and he can answer any and all of your questions what at that point. to get a super role. nice guy, too. I talked yeah. to him last week, and... Uh, like I said, he invited me to come out to the Mullet Lake one maybe for a day or two and just and get to meet some people. Just enjoy talking with them for that a little bit. Of, yeah, I'll have a great time. Are you kidding well, me? The, 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 the history of the school, Gary Roach and yeah. Al Linder started it in Minnesota. Yeah. The, and Gary Roach and Mark have been partners and friends for decades. A couple guys I've heard of before. Yeah, and uh, it got to a point where... Gary was focusing more on his guiding and then some tournament fishing, and Al was more focused on the, I guess, the end fishermen, mm -hmm. and then ultimately spawned off into, you know, Linder's Angling Edge, which they're right now, and so they gave it to Mark and said, all right, we've built this, you take it and do what you want with it. And One of my favorite, actually, I don't watch a lot of outdoor shows. I find a lot of them to be full of just things that I can't stomach. I'm just being br brutally honest, but Linder's um, Angling Edge is one of my favorites. Yeah. I really enjoy that show, so anyway. Check it out, search it up, Mark Martin's Ice Fishing Vacation School. Get on here. You want to learn how to ice fish or you just want to go ice fishing with some of the best? Get on here. Go for it. I think I'm going to really enjoy myself. Let's open it up here to questions. Let's see how many more people we got. We've got the, the one question from last week. I don't oh, remember yeah, yeah, who yeah. asked it, but they asked about uh, depths for Atlantis. Yes. Um, and I did do some checking. And I do have one of the my good friends. He's an outdoor writer. Uh, and a guide, mm -hmm. um, and I checked with him, and I said, "Hey, have you been? Have you ice fished for Atlantics?" And you know, gave him the background of the the question, which was, "I can catch them at, at first light, right under the ice, yes. and then after that, you know, what depth?" Good question too. Um, yeah, it was because I didn't have an answer. I've never fished them. He said that he has fished for them, and he said that uh, they are salmon. So obviously they're higher in the water column, feeding at night, which is why you can catch them right under the ice, first thing. Um, he said two things. He said, one, you know, as the morning goes on, as the sun comes up, those fish are gonna drop. 
and generally the lakes that they're in, the one that I know around here for sure is Torch Lake, mm -hmm. and it's very deep, but it's really clear water. Mm -hmm. So he said, watch on your electronics. If you see cruising fish that are coming by, at, if they're at 20 feet down, fish them at 18. They can clearly see it. He says, if they're 50 feet down, just be a couple feet above them. Right. Uh, he said, the other thing is, and he said it was a lake trout, but he said he can remember being on Crystal Lake one time and dropping and putting his, his spoon, hit the hit his hole, and about the time it made two flops, he, he's in 100 feet of water, he saw a mark starting to come up off from the bottom, and they met in the middle. And, mm. So that lake trout was laying in 100 feet of water and saw that spoon. Saw that coming. And then swam all the way up and bit because it. So they, in that clear water, yeah. they're obviously going to be able to see what you've got. Use your electronics to see where they're at mm -hmm. and fish above them. Or, as he put it, you really can't fish above them because they can see. You don't want to be below them. So if you're marking fish at 50 feet, obviously you don't want to be fishing at 75. Their eyes are on top of their head. They're looking up as they're swimming through the water. Put it above them. That's, I guess that's as good as I can give them. That is such a good point and something I learned when I was much, much younger. Um, fish above the fish. Because yeah. they are from bottom up predator, ambush predators. Because the eyes are situated on top of the head. Yeah, you get your stuff down below them, they're not gonna see it, they're not gonna care about it, and you're not gonna get bit. Exactly. And that's where flashers also come in really, really handy. So a couple uh, couple questions that came in from Three Sticks Outdoors. Thanks for posting these Three Sticks. Uh, we, we answered a couple of these, or you answered a couple of these, or both of them really already, but um, when walleye get picky, do you uh, do you downsize your lures and baits? Uh, Absolutely. Or just wait for them to turn on? I think you answered that pretty no, well. No, we, we downsize. Yeah. If, if, if they won't hit the horizontal bait, they won't hit the vertical bait, then we're gonna downsize. And if they still don't go, we're gonna downsize again. Yeah. Uh, so we just keep going smaller. And, and mm -hmm. you'll find that the later in the year you get, the more picky they get. But they no, good question. Yeah, good, good question. Thank you for posting that. And then he uh, also asked, how does live sonar change the game? I mean, is there something about it? Uh, I, I know he's it, talking about the poor looking No, sonar. yeah, it, it, yeah. The, well, and that's, I saw, I would, I would direct you guys, I was on YouTube, the other, well, I watched ours from last week because I was just curious how I sounded. <laughs> and uh, Jay Siemens I know. did yeah. a comparison of the Garmin, the Lowrance, and yes. the Humminbird yep. side by side. And he was, they were in a spot where they could jig and they could bring fish up and he had walleyes and whitefish tearing around. And it was, it was really interesting. So mm -hmm. if, if you're interested to see if that's something you're considering, I think he has a very unbiased Maybe it's that 20 minute. I've, video I've watched the video you're talking about. Yeah, it's it is great. excellent. Excellent. But the the live the what the any of the new imaging stuff, what it's doing, it, it does change the game a little bit because it helps if you understand what it's showing you. If you're fishing right up over the top, you can clearly see how that fish is reacting. On a flasher, you can just see if the fish darts away or it comes up slow or it comes up fast. And the imaging, you can almost see them swimming. So you know you can get a little bit better sense of their mood. If you turn the head on those things and you're pointing it around, mm -hmm. if you found the spot, I believe that the new imaging stuff will help you find the spot on the spot and be like, man, we need to be over another 10 that's, feet. That's a great point. Feet. Yeah, that's a great point because you're going to be able to actually see uh, almost like a camera. Yeah. Uh, what, the, what the heck is sitting around you? Yeah. yeah, great, great point. Three Sticks Outdoors or Three Sticks Eight, that was a great, great question. Thanks for posting those. Yeah. Let's open it up now uh, to anybody else that has any other questions. Don't be afraid. Seriously, do not be afraid to ask anything. Um, I'm trying to think of a couple things. I, I had a couple things in my head that you already covered that I was going to ask, but you already nailed them, so I don't need to. Uh, but uh, let's see what else we got here. Huey Merrill. We know Huey. I know Huey. Yeah, we like that. Uh, Huey's a good guy. Um, it says Lake Maps. Uh, Lake Maps and Avionics are the devil. <laughs> That's what Huey says. <laughs> Well, if you know how to read them, no. it, it, your, your little I, secret spot might not be so secret. Maybe Huey's yeah. just mad because more people are getting out there and catching more fish. Because Huey's always been pretty good fish. He right? catches enough. Yes, yeah, he, does. he does. So, well. so sorry, Huey. They are not the devil. Yeah, everybody is safe if they if they have one. Uh, Teresa Flanders says we just bought a Markham Seven with GPS. Can we get an SD card with mapping on it? I don't know the answer. To I don't know, but I know a bunch of the guys on Mark's Pro staff are Markham guys. I can. Um, if you can get the answer, I'll, I'll back circle to me. back. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see that, or I'll type it in the comments on the yeah. once the video gets. Teresa's on here all the time, so, so I'm sure she'll be she's active. got a Markham Seven. Yes. With GPS. Yes. Well, I would think so. I would think so too. 
I, I find out. Yeah, I think it would be just like a standard unit where you'd be able to. You could put the put an SD card. Yeah, in there, I, I think so too. SD. Teresa, more than likely, but uh, he's going to get to the bottom of that for you. Uh, Blind Osprey says he loved Roach's fish batter. I've yes. never tried it. I've never tried it. Is it good? It is. Well, Tim says it's good. I believe it. Uh, okay, Bob Hunter. Thoughts on lure colors per species? Time of the day, available daylight, time of season. Anything that you can uh, put in on that? I would say, again, if I focus on, on walleyes, low light, I want to glow. Something glow. Yeah. Um, and, and for me, you know, obviously the, this little golden glow spoon that I showed everybody earlier, I've, I've, I've been lots of success with that. Uh, if you're going with a wrap, I like, I honestly like the moonshine wraps. I love the because moonshine stuff. You can hit those with a with a flashlight, or if you've got the little UV light that's on your rod, so you can you can turn that on, you know, right here, It'd glow everything up. Uh, I like a fire tiger, but again, it's it's a confidence thing that that's what I'm going back yes. to. Yes. Yes. Um, I probably caught more things on fire tiger presentations than anything else, and that's why I always yep. go back to it also. Yep. But yeah. it's it's a confidence thing on on the colors. Because I guess we always kind of just go back to what has worked, and that's right. where we start. And if we catch fish, we don't deviate. Yeah. Um, but I've got an open mind on that too now, to where I mean, because my son will look in the box and he'll pull something out, and I'm like, God, what are you? And then he's just handling the fish, pulling them in, and I'm like, okay, I need to, let's need to switch. Like I said last year, when that guy handed me that spoon, and it was nothing I ever would have used at any time, and we pounded three fish, nice fish on that. I gotta remember to keep my brain open sometimes. That's, uh, that's why I love some of the people on here. They put some great things on here that I'll grab and I'll take off on the boat. And so. I think uh, for color-wise, sometimes you'll find that some lakes, some lakes will have uh, a color that works better on them. You know, a silver on, on oh, you sure, know, clear sure. water, a yeah. gold on a stained water, yes. you know, that, that type of stuff. Uh, but as far as the walleyes go, I mean, you know, not middle of the day stuff, but that first hour and a half mm -hmm. and that last hour and a half, I want something that's got some cool. Uh, from Jeff and Wendy Miller, Pat, do you upsize your treble hooks on your wraps? Yes. And spoons for wall. Thank you. Yep, on, on the wraps, we used to do that all the time because if you bought the jigging wrap, it came mm -hmm. with like a 12 or a 14 on the bottom. They're dinky And dinky. then we, we, I mean, we'd buy a VMC, a bigger one, and we'd stick it on there. Uh, recently, Rapala has, and this one they, I think is one of those, it is. They have gone to, I'll put this up close so you guys can see it. But you can see here, that's a pretty good sized treble hook on that it's tiny little wrap. Yeah. So they, Rapala has gone gone to fixing that. But uh, yes, I do upsize, uh, not so much on the spoons, but definitely on the wraps. Good. Jeff and Wendy Miller say thank you. Uh, but thank you for posting that comment. Oh, great. Uh, Leroy Downing from Purple Taco. When changing lights, uh, oh, I'm sorry. What charging light do you prefer for, for charging your glow jigs? I know you got the one on the rod. Do you have anything else? I've, um, yes. I have a Vexilar. Mm -hmm. And Vexilar makes what they call a glow ring. So I've got the Pro Pack. And right. It sits right on there, and you just plug it into the port that you plug your charger into. Mm -hmm. Hit a toggle switch, and so I can bring my jig up. And it's just a ring that's maybe inch and a half, two inches in diameter. And right. it's all, it's a series of the lights like this one where this right. is just a single you know that's got this nice little uv light it's a it's a ring of uvs and you just drop your lure in pull it up it's fully charged would you mind showing that up closer to the camera yeah, i just can, want people to get a look at that you can thing. see here we've got just this little light right here and we'll use it to i don't know if i can get it to probably not in this light to show you but we'll charge and then it's glowing I guess you can kind of see that. And I think you found, you said you found that, uh, that's from Rapala, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yep. you can get it right, www.rapala.com. So what is it, Rapala or Rapala? I grew up saying Rapala. It's Rapala. Is it Rapala? And I only know that because Mark has a really good story about that. Okay, so. we'll get to that another day. I I don't think I'll ever say anything but Rapala, but- uh, it's, it's, it's been, I had to change because that was the way I grew up. Too. Yeah, it's always been Rapala for me. All right, um, Brian Lord. Do you prefer plastics or live bait for panfish? That's a good question. Uh, we touched a little on that last we week. I prefer both. Yeah. I like to catch fish. And so I think it's one of those where uh, with the new soft plastics, those things can be fantastic, especially when you get something that's got a good tail on it that you just barely have to twitch it and that tail has got a nice flutter to it. Uh, but they don't always want that. And okay, if they don't, then, then you know we'll, we'll have a waxy or a spike or something. But uh, 
Keep on talking. I'll be <laughs> he must be going to get something out of the shop. As, as far as that goes, I've always got a variety with me. And, we, and I kind of let the fish dictate as to what it is that I'm going with. I'm not one over the other. Uh, the group of guys that we do fish with, which is primarily March Pro staff, we will, some of those guys are hardcore and all who use the soft plastics. Some days they catch the crap out of them and other days, you know, the guys that are using the wax worms and the spikes are catching all of them. And I just like to catch fish. So once we figure out that they want soft plastics or they want wax worms, that's the route we're going to go with that. So I hope that that answered that question for you. Well, I apologize. I thought, I know we have some plastics in here, and I was going to show them, but uh, I can't seem to find them. So I don't know if they're up on the shelf or not yet, but we do have, there's a huge selection of uh, panfish plastics in this shop. Good. And I know they're, they're locally made, because I was here the one day the guy delivered them, and they look great. And I forget the name on them. I wanted to show some off, but... I don't see them right now, so we'll just move on. All right. Uh, Garland Hancock said, do you upsize your hooks on spoons? You already answered that. You said not on the spoons. Not, not so much on the spoons. Right. The, the slender spoons, got a, if those are pretty decent. And then if I'm using, I guess the other spoons that I typically like are beta knock stuff. So um, uh, do jiggers or uh, Swedish pimples, those come with a pretty stout hook. Yes, they do. We don't, we don't have to worry so much on those. And, and I know that uh, if I'm looking down in my box, um, Cleo's come with a good one. So no, typically I'm not upsizing that. Um, I agree. If, one, if I bend a hook or break one, then I'm, I'm putting something back on that's pretty much that exact same size. I completely agree with that. Do jiggers are some of my favorites. Some of my favorite jiggers. Uh, let's see here. John Thompson, I want to know what your thoughts on live scope. We pretty much covered that already. It's a great tool. Yeah, it's um, fantastic. It's what it pricey. It's pricey. Yeah, they, they don't give them away. No. And if it's something that's in your budget, um, plan on a learning curve. We've had uh, students the last couple years that have brought that. They've just got as a Christmas gift, and they brought it to the to the school. And it, it's taken a little bit to get it dialed in and set up the way that they want it. I can imagine. So you just, I mean, it isn't something you're just going to plug and play with, but I think if you spend the time to kind of get to know it a little bit, that you'll really like the results. I, I completely agree, but yeah, like anything else, take the time to get to know it. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, Bill Gerlach says he has the ability, ability to create mapping from his Raymarine Axiom, so with the Navion's chip. That goes back to uh, Teresa Flanders' question. Mm -hmm. If he's able to do it, I imagine, Teresa, you will be able to do it also. Bob Hunter says, thanks for the reply. Bob, thanks for asking the question. Uh, Three Sticks says, download the app to your smartphone if Markham... Let me say it again in English. Download the app on your smartphone if the Markham doesn't accept the upgraded maps. Good point. Uh, Bob Reed says, best setup and bait for early season uh, jaw jackers for daytime. For daytime. So, um, you can go one of two routes. With, with those. Um, I'll just show you the one I've got here kind of set up as a dead stick. That you'll have, uh, I'll have a, we talked about this last week, but it's just my dead stick. It's a bobber, a couple of split shot, and a number 12 uh, VMC treble. With this, you can put a minnow on that, get it set, you know, have your jaw jacker set, and that would go. The you know, you're fishing it very similar to like this dead stick or you're fishing it very similar to a tip up in that you've got a minnow set 15, 18, 20, 24 inches up off bottom. It's swimming around, fish grabs it, and then obviously the jaw jacker starts working. Uh, the other option that you can do with that, and this is something that I thought is pretty cool. I'll just grab it. Is that you can take... get it hooked here instead of the split shot in the small trouble you can take a spoon so in this case I've got just a kind of a green and glow Cleo you can hook that minnow on it and as it swims around you've got this spoon flashing so it's got you can charge it up for some glow mm -hmm. and then you've got depending on how deep you are the glow may or may not be an issue like you say midday 
Maybe you just want it all silver, like the back of this is silver, and that can flutter around. But again, set that thing up. Um, if you're fishing walleyes, that bottom little bit. If you're fishing pike, obviously, that could be much higher. Sure could. Yep. Um, uh, for example, we were fishing 40 feet of water in Mullet Lake a few years ago, and I set one of these 10 feet down, just a spoon under a tip-up. It wasn't a jaw jacker, but mm -hmm. thinking that there are some good trout in there, and maybe we could get one of those to hit, and we ended up catching a pike. So yep. 10 feet down over 40 feet of water. But if I were going to have a jaw jacker, one of those two would be my setup. So just a simple uh, split shot and some treble. Sure. Or you could use a spoon like this. And, uh, and maybe just vary the colors throughout mm -hmm. the time of the days to, to yep. apply to what yep. you, you might You might find that the color and the spoon doesn't matter, or you might find that, yep. man, only the one of those that I got set up that's got a blue spoon on it is, is working. Great, great question. Thanks for That's a great answer, too. Um, Leroy Dodding says thanks for the answer. He said he had no idea if XR had a light like that. He will definitely get one. That I love it. <laughs> they're they're, <laughs> that is they're pretty, pretty inexpensive, right, to be honest with you. They're great. Yeah, I'll also throw this out there. If you're looking for a flasher, Markham, Vexilar, um, what else do we have here? I believe we have Hummingbird. Yep. Um, if you're looking, we do have them. I know they're hard to find this year, like a lot of things. They are in stock. If you go on the TangleTackleCompany.com website, they are available here. For as long as they last, and uh, what a that'd be a cool Christmas present. If my wife's watching, that would be a great Christmas present. All right, let's see what else we got. And this is a good question from Mega Mike. How do you target a location on Saginaw Bay because it is so flat and there's no structure? Yeah, that 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 comes down to first time that we get to Saginaw Bay every year. We're stopping into the local tackle shops and just yes. just to get an idea of where the fish are. Yep. The other thing that we've got in our favor over there is that a couple of Mark's Pro Staff guys are guides, ice guides and open water guides on the bay. So you and, got the end. So we've got a you know we can show up and he's like, hey, I've been catching fish in. You know, they're not all based right out of Linwood when we have the school. So I mean, you know, Brandon is on the east side of the bay and that's. Bay's got to freeze over, and you got to have a long runner. You got a right. trailer to get to where he's typically fishing. Right. But at least we have that to start with. Um, I would stop and, and just talk to go to Frank's Great Outdoors or yep. go to yep. you know any of those smaller little tackle shops in all of those little towns, and just say, I mean, how far out do I got to go to get it? And then you're gonna have to drill some holes. So you're gonna if you're not marking, if you fish someplace and you're there a half hour, forty minutes, like you say, it is flat. And sometimes it's just a depth of water, and sometimes it's, it's location. But we just drill until you get to all of a sudden you might get into a spot and the fish are just hanging in that area. You might catch them there for a yeah. week yeah. at a time. So one thing I'll add on to that, and I'll, I'll, I'll kin this back to salmon fishing, what I'll tell people is you're going to get one person probably out of ten that will give you information. Yeah. and that, Maybe more. Um, depends, I guess, where you are and whatnot. But information is sometimes very difficult to come by when it comes to fishing, secret spots, things like that. But pound the fish cleaning stations also. Pound the tackle shops. Ask the clerks. Um, start a network. If you get a phone number, store it in your phone. If you get two, start idea. that network going. Make a make a network um, text chain where you guys can all, say you get 10 guys and gals on that thing and you got a network going, you make that group. And when you send out a text, it goes to everybody. And if they hear something from somebody else, they'll add it to the group. That's a great way to get going. It takes time. It truly does take time. Because um, again, a lot of people don't like to throw out that walleye information. Yeah, yeah it's, and, and there's, you know, I mean, Saginaw Bay's got hundreds of thousands of walleyes yeah. in it. So, I mean, it's not like yeah. there's only one spot to catch them. But they're all over. But. Make sure if you're willing to take information, you're willing to give information because it is a two way street. Yep. Anybody that gives me info knows that they can call me any day. I mean, I run a YouTube channel. I mean, <laughs> people know I'm pretty free with the information, but. I'm always willing to give out information to anybody, especially if they give me good info. So great, great uh, question there, Mega Mike. Really good question. Let's see what else we got coming. Uh, BMK wanted to know if I was talking about the plastics that came in the little plastic tubes. No, that's a different one, BMK. I wish I could find one I would show you. <laughs> just a pro says he's new to fish in Saginaw Bay advice for fanning finding fish without just jumping on a pack of shanties So I would I would advise against jumping on a pack yeah, of shanties. Yeah, that uh, um, <laughs> I mean you covered it just in the last yeah, question. I, but yeah. I, I, I think in, 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 in so did you that uh, information um, 
being able to, to go in and talk to the guys in the shops. You know, they aren't going to give you a, a particular coordinate, but they might say two miles out in 15 feet of water, the guys have been catching some right. fish. And that, that would be where you could go start and then start working from there. Well, you're right. I mean, just be ready to drill some holes because yeah. you're going to be moving. Yeah. Yeah. You might luck out and get right on top of them the first time, but uh, highly doubt you're going to be moving. Good questions, though, guys. Um, Garland Hancock says, great video tonight. Thank you, Garland. Appreciate that. Braid or mono on your walleye lines? Braid. Braid. I, I have suffix 832 in six-pound test mm -hmm. up to a barrel swivel, and then I have a six-pound fluorocarbon leader that's 18, 20 inches long from that right. barrel swivel to the snap. And, then the and I know you board. covered it last week, but I remember you saying, you know, there's no stretch in that braid. Gives you a little better action on your retrieves, your jigs, everything yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Good question, though. Good, good question. Uh, Brian Burton says, what's up, Chris? I don't know, Brian, what's up with you, man? <laughs> good to see you, though. Uh, Bob Hunter, best way to transport and keep minnows lively while on the ice? That is a good question. Good question. Yes. Uh, we do it a couple of different ways. Um, some of the guys, because again, we're transporting, we've got a haul, it's on a quad, it's on the snow machine for a while before we get to where we're going to fish. Um, I have got the Frable Bait Keeper, mm -hmm. the 13 port. I had the 19, it was way too big. Yeah. I got rid of the 19, so I got the 13, but it has a built in aerator in it, so a couple of batteries. Same one, yes. You hit the, hit the switch, and it's going to aerate them and, and keep them going. Um, you don't want the water to get warm, keep the water nice and cold. Um, it, the the bulk of your quality bait shops are going to have a chiller in their tanks so when you get your minnows the, the water's already right. chilled right that that's part of it um what would you do throughout the day to keep your minnows cold i mean obviously uh, it's cold I'll, outside, I'll, a lot of times i will pull water i've always got a cup in we catch a fish and we want to keep it in really good shape mm -hmm. i've got a five gallon bucket that's always just floating around in my shack there you go. i'll use that cup put enough water in it you put a fish in it for a picture or, right. or for right. whatever. Right. So I'll take that same cup and, and I'll drain the water out and then add right from whatever lake it is that we're fishing, we'll add that coming, I mean, it's nice and cold. It's, yeah. Yeah. it's got it has oxygen a, it. Has, yeah, it has some added bonuses to that as well, like oxygen. Yeah. So I, I would say an insulated, uh, some sort of insulated container. So, you know, I mean, I used to use a, a little cooler, Yeah. you know, a little, I forget what it is, the kind of coolers. You can get the styrofoam ones like Bud's got over here. Um, those will work as well. But but something that's insulated, that one is going to try to keep the water from freezing, but will keep it cooler. A lot of times when we come in at night, we've got a breezeway wherever it is we're staying, or we'll stick our, we, we'll leave the our, our bait outside to try to not have that water warm up and kill those, those minnows off. So that's how we try to keep them. Good answer. I thought we had one of those little, I know we had some of those Frables here before. They might be hiding on me right now, but those, I've had that thing for probably a decade or more, and it still works just, just fine. Yep. Oh, let's see what else we got here. Teresa Flanders says, Chris and Pat, thank you for so so much for all the great information. They learned quite Good. a lot today. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I hope everybody maybe grabs something out of this. Um, I know I did. Um, Here's a question I did want to ask you. Pike fishing. Mm -hmm. Benefits to fishing over weed beds, deep water versus weed edges. Any luck doing that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, we'll fish right over the top of them, absolutely. Okay. Because, uh, and, and I'll use Houghton Lake as an example. Well, one of my buddies that's over there, he has a place on the lake, is a cottage. Um, he talks about that, and that lake has got some huge weed beds mm -hmm. and he'll go over the top of them in the summer and he says you'll see those pike will just back their way into the weeds and just lay there and wait for something to right. come over so right. he'll throw buzz baits or something you know he only got this much water but he's like you catch some fallacious pike over the tops of those so if you're in deeper water i think the same thing is going to be I true so they'll, they'll, they'll slide in there and just kind of chill yeah. relax and if all of a sudden you've got a nice minnow kind of coming over the top if you've got a decent in deep water, the fish won't just come around the outside of it, plus they've got eyes on top of their head. Absolutely. Yep. So yes, I would, I would not just, if you're going to target pike in deep water, or walleye for that matter, I, think so. uh, yep. I wouldn't just focus on the edge. 
being on top of that weed, you know, I mean, say the weeds came up three or four feet. Right. Absolutely. I mean, you could fish over the top of those. Second feet. question I have for you, your favorite minnow for tip-ups. I love blue shiners. I do too. Okay. We're talking the same language here. All right. Second favorite. Do you have them? If we can't get blues, the smallest sucker you can get. Yeah. I was going to say suckers or something. I was going to bring that up. I mean, they... I don't mean to sound like the bandwagon. No. Guy here, they, but yes, they, suckers are amazing. They, they, I mean, you catch... Everybody knows pike leaf. Walleyes yeah. will eat them too. I've never caught a walleye in a sucker. That's, oh, that's we, good to know. We do really well on them, but it, it's small. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you just... I mean, I'll come in and... You know, irregardless of the lake that we're at, yeah. if, if I see they got some suckers, I'm like, hey, give me six of the smallest suckers that you've got in your tank. And right. The smallest of them, the absolute smallest. And I'll put them on a tip up just like I will a blue. And mm -hmm. yeah, that was, we fished Lake Gogebic way yeah, up yeah. on the west end UP. of the UP. Yeah. And the suckers up there, I mean, it was crazy. You had, that's all you I never, them. I never caught a walleye on a sucker. I never but even could, thought to. You had target. sucker minnows that were three inches, four sure. inches long. and. Okay, you know, good they're hardy, so you can See? catch you can catch a couple on it. I learned something right there. That's uh, thanks. I appreciate that. But yeah, blue shiners. Without a I love blues. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. All right, I think we're winding down here. Uh, Garland Hancock says lions win. Yes, they did. <laughs> Enjoy it while you can, Mr. Hancock, because it might be another year before we get another one. Um. T.D. Schlaub said screw top thermos with an air pump works great. I think he's yes. talking about minnows. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Anything uh, with an air rig. Uh, if, you can, if you can put some air into it and then it's insulated, I would say that that would be perfect. So a screw top thermos is exactly yeah. that. Uh, one last question, then we'll wrap up after this because this is, this is a pretty good question. Robert Pringle wants to know, he, he's saying he's anxious to get on the ice. What's the best Michigan walleye lake that usually ices up early? That's a that's a really good one, and, um, and it's very at, and and I think you it, we'll, we'll just talk Lower Peninsula. Yeah, because yeah. uh, uh, I'm not sure on the UP of when they ice up, but I would say you've got I, I, three lakes come right to mind. Uh, you've got lakes Cadillac, Mitchell, and Lake Holton Lake. Those those and, three and, lakes. and those they're at higher elevations. Mm -hmm. I mean they're they're up quite a bit. I mean they're always good snow there, and they. They get the they're away from Lake Michigan, yep. so they don't have all of the winds like we have here. So you get calm nights, cool temperatures. Those three lakes tend to ice up first, and all three of those lakes have a very nice population. I was in Cadillac last week, and Mitchell already had skim on shore it. ice. Yeah, I yep. saw that Saturday. Well, yeah, Cadillac had shore, but Mitchell actually had skim. Yeah, most of the way I could see across. So. It was windy Saturday afternoon. And some of it had pushed so up. So it yeah blew it all over. Okay, that's a really good. But it's coming. And you're right, Holton Lake is fantastic. That, that is a mecca in itself for, for walleye, especially, I know. All right, we're going to wrap it up there. Thanks so much for being here, Pat. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks to all of you that asked the questions tonight. No, great questions. Yeah, too. they really were. Don't forget um, the Patreon giveaway. If you didn't see that, if you want to go on patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and just look up Tangle Tackle Fishing. Anybody that supports us on Patreon, there's a spoon box down there. I'm not going to pick it up because your rods are on it, but I have... Well, it's all down there. All there. <laughs> I have at I least twenty. I have at least twenty-four super slim spoons. I'm going to throw in that spoon box, brand new. You're going to have a chance to win that two weeks from tonight, and then the big charter giveaway on uh, December thirty-first. Someone's going to win all that, and uh, yeah, that's about it. We're going to wrap it up right there. Three sticks outdoors. So thanks, Chris and Pat. Tight lines. Be safe. You do the same, guys. Same all here. right, we're going to get out of here. Thanks, everybody. Take care. See you next Sunday.